Jun Fujita was born in the late 1800s in a village near Hiroshima, Japan. By 1906, he had migrated to North America before settling in Chicago in 1915. Although he studied to become an electrical engineer, his true passion was in photography, poetry, and art. And so, he became a photographer for the Chicago Evening Post, where he gained recognition as one of the most respected photojournalists in the city. Fujita's work often focused on the lives of immigrants and working-class people, capturing the human condition in all of its beauty and ugliness. Some of his photographs range from the famous Albert Einstein to the infamous Al Capone. Through his lens, June captured wheat farms in Illinois, haystacks, the Chicago skyline, the Lincoln Park Zoo, and beautiful shots of clouds floating through the sky. Amidst the stillness of his captures, the photographer's lens revealed not just the pretty, but also the piercing tragedies that stained Chicago. One of Fujita's most famous photographs was taken in 1915 during the Eastland disaster. On July 24th of 1915, the SS Eastland was preparing to depart from the Chicago River with more than 2,500 passengers and crew members on board. The ship was reserved by Western Electric for a company picnic. As passengers were boarding, the ship began to list to one side. Despite efforts to stabilize the vessel, it continued to tip until it eventually rolled onto its side, dropping hundreds of people below deck. The tragedy unfolded in just a matter of minutes. Passengers who had been sitting on the upper deck were able to escape, but those in the lower deck were trapped. Many of them drowned in the cold and murky waters of the Chicago River. Rescue efforts were launched immediately, and over the course of the day, more than 800 people were pulled from the water, but sadly, 844 people lost their lives. Jun Fujita's shots of the Chicago race riots in 1919 are some of the most powerful and moving works. The black and white photographs serve as a metaphor and stark reminder of the deep-seated racial tensions that stained the city. After the Civil War ended slavery, white supremacy found ways to re-establish itself in the South through sharecropping, poll taxes, the KKK, and Jim Crow laws. Many black Americans decided to leave the South and move northward as part of the Great Migration, drawn to the promise of new industrial jobs and a better life in cities like Chicago. They created vibrant neighborhoods like the Black Belt on Chicago's South Side. With the end of World War I, many white Americans returning home found cities like Chicago were more diverse than what they remembered, and tensions boiled over as part of the Red Summer. The riots were sparked by an incident at a segregated beach on Lake Michigan. On July 27th, a young black man named Eugene Williams was swimming in the black section of the beach when he accidentally drifted into the white section. A group of white men began throwing stones at Williams, and when he tried to swim back to the black side, he drowned. Police, who were called to the scene, refused to arrest the white men who had thrown the stones, further inflaming the tensions between the city's black and white communities. Over the next several days, violence and unrest spread throughout the city's south side. Mobs attacked black neighborhoods, burning homes and businesses and attacking residents with clubs and other weapons. Black residents fought back, forming armed patrols to protect their communities. The police were largely ineffective in quelling the violence, and in some cases even sided with the white mobs. On July 28th of 1919, a 30-year-old black man named John Mills was on his way home after his shift at the stockyards. He boarded a streetcar, but before it could reach his destination, it had to pass through the white Irish neighborhood of Canaryville. 
Unfortunately, Mr. Mills never made it back home. A white crowd of 300, including children, stopped the streetcar and the white driver and passengers got off, leaving Mr. Mills and the other black passengers behind. The white crowd proceeded to attack the black passengers with bricks and clubs and they dragged Mr. Mills out of the car. Mr. Mills managed to escape and ran down an alley with the white crowd in pursuit. The photographer, Jun Fujita, captured the scene of the chase on film, which became known as the first murder ever caught on film. Eventually, the white crowd caught up to Mr. Mills and stoned him to death in a dead end. Despite the presence of police who recognized some of the white attackers from the local athletic club, no one was arrested. Nearly a decade later, on February 14th of 1929, Fujita was one of the first journalists at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The massacre was a gangland killing in which seven men were lined up against a garage wall and shot to death. The victims were members of a rival gang, and the killings were ordered by Al Capone. Fujita's photo of the massacre is one of the most iconic images in American history. It shows the seven victims lying in a pool of blood, capturing the brutality of the crime. In his later years, following the attack on Pearl Harbor which sparked World War II, Despite his talent and accomplishments, Fujita faced discrimination due to his Japanese ancestry. Working for the Chicago Daily News was denied and he was forced to move to Michigan City, Indiana to continue his artistic pursuits. It was there that he found solace in poetry and his work often reflected the pain and injustice he felt as a Japanese American. Despite the challenging and often dangerous nature of his work, Fujita married Florence Carr and became a father to his son Graham. He continued to work as a photojournalist until his death in the year 1963. His legacy as one of the most important photojournalists of the early 20th century endures and his work continues to inspire and challenge viewers today.